Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Road to Continuous Deployment. Um, what I'm about to tell you is a project which happened in the Netherlands last year. Uh, what I'm about to tell you may or may not apply on the project you are involved in. Just a small disclaimer. Um, and also, I'm going to uh, speak for about 45 minutes, and this particular project took over a year. Um, so I'm going to summarize a little bit and speed over things a little bit. Uh, but you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, so I'm sure you'll understand. Anyway, welcome. A little bit about me. I'm a Dutch freelance uh, Java, PHP, and Scala programmer. Um, I do a lot of consulting, some speaking, training. Um, I recently started a company called Make.io, uh, which uh, builds continuous deployment pipelines with infrastructure and consultancy as a service. Um, also part of a Dutch group of freelancers, the Dutch Web Alliance. Um, if you know the build tool Thing, uh, I maintain that. And if you want to reach me, that's my Twitter handle. Right, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the background of the project that we did, um, how we approach the project, what we said in terms of process and standards and rules, um, onto build pipelines, which is the meat of the talk, and then finally results and lessons learned. So this all happened in uh, Amsterdam in the Netherlands, close to the river, beautiful part of Amsterdam. Uh, at a company called uh, the Pairs Group Employment Solutions, which is a large company um, that uh, hosts job sites in the Netherlands. Uh, and job sites containing well over uh, 100k jobs, so pretty large sites. Um, this project was in, well, mostly last year and a little bit in 2014. The problem with this project was that they had a system called San Diego, uh, a big PHP monolith, uh, close to a million lines of code, um, very much a legacy monolith. Um, problem with it, it generated or generates significant income. It's a large company, generates significant money. However, it's very slow, very complicated, with lots of technical debt. And that looks a little something like this. At the top, we have the three job sites that they, uh, that they host. Below them, there's a bunch of load balancers, varnish, cash, uh, other things. And then below that, there's the front end uh, servers, which all talk to each other, and they talk to a bunch of back end servers. Problem with that setup is that the exact same code is deployed on the front end servers and the back end servers. And through a setting, it either behaves as a front end or as a back end. And then there's a bunch of MySQL and other cache stuff in the bottom. Relatively complicated picture. Other problems, they, the team was having to do manual releases, usually on weekends. Um, they usually took the site down for a bunch of hours. Uh, and the problem with job sites it, is that people tend to browse for jobs at night and in the weekend. The releases were infrequent, not a steady heartbeat every two weeks, every week or whatever. Sometimes there was four weeks or six weeks. Uh, lots of hot fixes. The tests that they had were increasingly fragile, falling over for no particular reason. Velocity of the team was low. Uh, a lot of outages and bugs and, and general issues, which all led to a team that was pretty well frustrated with how things were going. And as a result, they had low confidence in modifying the code. So even simple features took a long time to implement. So clearly something had to be done and management set a few goals. First more and the most important, reduce the number of issues so that we can spend the time on implementing actual business value. Also to reduce cycle time. And by cycle time, we mean the time it takes for an ID to be put into code and actually be shown to a customer. So a new feature to actually be useful to a customer and reduce that time. Third goal, increase the productivity of the team, increase the velocity, make them, well, 
deliver value faster and better. And the last one, which may even be the most important one, increase the motivation of the team and reduce the frustration. So with all these, these issues and goals combined, there are two things you can do. Or well, we discussed two things initially. Should we refactor or should we rebuild a cut over rewrite? So a, a, a rewrite of the entire system. Well, refactoring was tried and three or four months of refactoring, the code coverage got up to two and a half percent. So, and that's not because the team was not good at it. They were very enthusiastic, but it just takes a long time. The code was very complex. And with that two and a half percent, they didn't even touch the most complicated core parts of the system. So projecting that two and a half percent, it will take years to get to a reasonable state. So that was definitely off the table, right? Now, rebuilding, the problem with that is this company had been in business for well over 10 years. So a lot of decisions were made and those decisions get lost. The why get lo gets lost easily. So what you would do with a rebuild is effectively rebuilding or rewriting the entire system, including all the bugs, including all the weird business decisions that you don't know were there or were made and effectively you are building the same exact same system and at some point there will be a big bang release and then everything will be fine of course so that that wasn't a, uh, a good solution either so what then well the approach we took is something uh, to apply something we call the strangler pattern which uh, i'll explain in a little bit um, on the right, you see a bunch of the, the stack that we used. Um, but most importantly, we started implementing services per domain object. And this being a job site, you have the job seeker, you have jobs and a few companies and a few other domain objects. And we created a service per object. And then we added a proxy to switch between the old code and the new code and we migrated individual pages. That looks a little something like this. On the left, you have the original monolith connecting to a database. Then we add a proxy between the monolith and the user. And initially, that proxy doesn't do anything. Then we add a new service. And that service starts implementing a new page, for example, a login page or something else. The proxy then switches traffic over from the monolith to the new service. And this can even be based on, you know, the IP or something else. And then at we start writing the up those services, adding features, more services, until at some point the monolith is not doing anything anymore and can be safely switched off and removed. So all the services that are implemented are behind load balancers so that we can deploy multiple versions of them or multi multiple replicas. Um, they access legacy databases in some cases, continuous deployment, everything is in Docker, and the front ends are services themselves. They're at the same level. So the new architectural diagram then turns out to be three front ends for three services for the front ends, uh, two services for our most important domain objects. And over here on the left, we have San Diego isolated. San Diego runs in its own data center and the rest runs in Amazon, all in the cloud. Now to get there, we had to set a few rules and standards, guidelines for the team. We started off with a scrum process with a sprint of one week, which is very, a very short sprint requires you to have short meetings to keep the overhead low. We also did a lot of TDD and BDD. Who here regularly does TDD? Okay, and BDD? Okay, I'll come to the definition of those terms later. Definition of done was um, put down by the team. When is a story complete? When is it actually delivered to the customer? 
Um, team experience and team mindset, very important. I mentioned they were frustrated, so we had to make sure that the experience levels were right, that we uh, mixed experienced people with less experienced people, brought in some people from the outside, etc. And the last two parts is focus on value. And we focused on new values, so new features. And with building new features, eventually the old monolith becomes obsolete. All the old features become obsolete. That was the plan. During development, we emphasize that everything needs to be continuous. And it all starts off with continuous integration, which is you have one or more developers on the left. They build code, they check it in, and Jenkins or Travis or something else starts running, building it and testing it. That's CI. It doesn't actually deploy anything yet. Going up to continuous delivery then, you see acceptance and production in the picture now. And we automatically deploy after the build to acceptance. But we don't automatically deploy to production yet. It's just that every, t well, every moment of the day, we should be able to deploy to production. But the moment we do is decided by one of us, by a human. And then true continuous deployment is where that last step is also automated right there's no human involved anymore once it gets deployed to acceptance and it's okay we deploy to production immediately why would we do something like this to achieve small steps single commits that get deployed to production small steps small increases in value that leads to less overhead. There's less things that go, can go wrong. S smaller failure rate or low failure rate. Leads to early feedback. You know sooner when something is working or not working. And at the goal that we stated before, reducing the cycle time, that's what you get. It also reduces risk massively. If you do small steps, the amount that can go wrong in a small step is small as well. Whereas if you bundle everything up in a release every four weeks, then there's a lot that can go wrong, right? Now, one of the rules we stated early on is that you only commit the master. And that means no branches ever. This is very controversial, um, but it, it's required for this to work. I'll tell you why. If you do branches and a pull request is a branch, you get delayed integration. A branch will lead to merge conflicts, potentially, will lead to large steps, potentially. A pull request, for example, you can put in three, four, five X commits in one pull request, and then we're back to big releases, right? And if we merge a pull request to master, and that pull request is big, then we start deploying a huge change to master and to production. So then the small steps part, which I discussed just now, is gone, right? Well, one thing then people say to me is, OK, if I can't do pull requests, I can't do code reviews, because that's what pull requests are for. Well, that's why you do pair programming. I wouldn't advise it to do it like this, but <laughs> pair programming is essential when you do continuous deployment. Because if you do code reviews on a pull request, that's a code review which is delayed, right? And if you do pair programming, it's a code review which happens real time. And the idea with pair programming is, of course, that you couple a less experienced developer with a more experienced developer. And then you get two birds with one stone. You have knowledge transfer from the experienced developer to the less experienced developer. And you have the reviews. And then people say, but yeah, then still things slip through the cracks. Sure, but they do with pull requests as well. Pretty much the same. This is just real time. And it 
fixes the delayed integration. Now, another very important part is the Boy Scout rule. And for people that don't know this rule, it's leave the campsite in a better state than you found it, or leave the code in a better state than you saw it. Because if you don't, you get the broken window syndrome, where one window in a house breaks, and then people are like, ah, we'll, we'll fix that tomorrow. And then a second window breaks, and a third, and pretty soon people will be like, this, this house is, is in shambles anyway, we're not going to fix that. And that's the point you need to avoid. So Boy Scout rule, very important. Quality is a precondition for speed. You cannot go fast if you don't have quality. So we have a few quality gates in this project as well. Um, a syntax check, very simple but very useful. Um, sonar for technical debt, duplication, stuff like that. But the most important one, and here's another one, controversial one, 100% code coverage as a rule. In the, this project, the pipeline would break if you had 99.9% .9 after your commit. You notice the asterisk at the end? The reason we did 100% code coverage in this project is because it's PHP. And that's not something against PHP. It's that PHP is an interpreted language and not a compiled language. So if you remove a method in PHP or in Ruby or Python, your user is going to find out, not your compiler. That is, if your tests don't cover that part of the code, right? So that's what we said to the team. Make sure that all that code is covered so you can safely and refactor your code, change your code, and still be fast. One thing we used a lot as well um, is something called feature toggles. If you do continuous deployment and you do small steps, um, you may not be able to release a feature in one commit. You probably won't. But then how would you hide that feature from your users until it's ready? Well, feature toggle is one way to do that. It would be something like a cookie, for example, that you only set when the feature is done for users. And you could set it for the people in your own network, your colleagues, for example, so that they can get early access, early preview of the feature. And it also enables A-B testing. We have a new version of a page, and we only show that new version to 10% of the people that come on the site. And then when that's satisfactory, we go up to 50% and then 100. DevOps is something that um, was required in this project uh, in terms that if you require some infrastructure and you're required to deploy something on that infrastructure, it's your responsibility as well. It's not something like, here's my deployment, throw it over to some operational people and they put it live and they get called on the weekend when things break. No. It's a team responsibility. So developers and ops people are in the same team, no walls. Last thing here is the dashboard. You can never have enough dashboards. Um, with continuous deployment and a project that moves so fast, it's very important that you keep tabs on what's happening where. So add metrics for uh, how fast your page is loading, how many people see it, how long they stay on the site. And then you can see that stuff changing if you add new features or change uh, the location of a button, for example. Very useful. Okay, and then moving on to building the actual code, the build pipeline. And in the build pipeline, we try to automate everything that's repeatable. And what's repeatable in this case? Building, testing, deploying, configuration. Basically, everything that you could write in a list of steps, in a list of steps for a human to do, you need to automate that. 
because humans can make mistakes, automated systems don't. Well, they only make the mistakes you put in. So very important, automation. And every commit that's made goes to production. It could be two or three commits together if they come in like half a second or a second in between, but every commit goes to production. To get to that point, we need to have some confidence in the code that we're deploying, right? That's where we start defending in depth. At the bottom, at the top left, we start with our unit tests. Simple unit tests um, using PHP unit in this case. Um, we add a few mocks here and there to make sure that the unit tests run fast and that we don't actually do any external database calls or web service calls or stuff like that. Then moving on to integration tests, which could do actual database calls, right? Or stuff that links components together to test whether they work together. And then BDD, behavior driven development. The scenario you see there is something you would write, it's, it's natural language. It's always written in the form given when then. Given the world is in a certain state, when something happens, then I expect this, right? These are what they call, are part of user stories. And these specifications are written by business, testers, developers, all working together. And then finally, we have UI tests. So a Selenium, for example, or something else, clicking on actual stuff, uh, making sure that our JavaScript runs the way it should. And then the question is always, what is the testing engineer going to do, our tester on our team? Because he doesn't have any point in the pipeline where he um, well, there's no manual involvement in the pipeline anymore, right? We go automatically to production. So what's the role of the tester here? Well, the tester is very important because the tester knows the system inside and out, and he actually should write these acceptance criteria together with business people and developers. Very important. But also, he should do manual testing after the fact, so uh, exploratory testing testing parts of the system, whether they still work the way we think they do. Because if we look at continuous testing and the testing pyramid, in the bottom we have unit tests, integration tests, acceptance, UI, and at the top smoke tests. Now smoke tests are when you deploy a service, check whether it's up, whether it's healthy, whether it's uh, responding to your requests, in the way that you think it should do, right? Get a job and it should return a job, something like that. <coughs> now you see on the left that the cost of the tests rises as you go up. So UI tests are far slower, far more expensive than unit tests. Unit tests are far faster than UI tests. The speed goes down as you go up. And what it also means is that unit tests it's wider at the bottom than at the top. Unit tests are the most frequent. Of unit tests, you have thousands. Then you have hundreds of integration tests, maybe hundreds of acceptance tests, but it's a lot l less than the number of UI tests or number of unit tests. And at the left there, you see that, that little cloud, exploratory testing, it's what I just mentioned. The QA people on the team can do that, exploratory testing. And on the right, that's something that's easily overlooked, but very important part, monitoring. People always say monitoring is not testing, and that's not the case. Monitoring is testing after the fact, after your deployment. For example, if part of your code only breaks when there are 100 million people on the site, that is a test. And that's something your monitoring can detect, and then you can make sure that it doesn't happen again. 
because testing is never a hundred percent watertight it's or waterproof you try to do the most you can in the time that you have and the build pipeline should be fast enough but you can never test for everything and that's where monitoring is the last fail safe so if we then put this all in a pipeline then we could see something like this this is the pipeline as code a plugin in Jenkins it's relatively recent but very useful uh, we don't click anything anymore in Jenkins we define our pipeline as code and here we have it defined in stages the run tests stage is the the top one we run PHP unit and then B hat then we build our docker image we push it to repository and then we deploy to acceptance and finally to production if any of these parts fail the the build stops the build is red our docker file looks something like this simple PHP 7 image simple code rel uh, relatively and then when we deploy it could go something like this at the top we pull our image from the docker registry using docker pull then we start a new container on a machine somewhere docker run we wait for it to come up it should expose a port usually to be useful and then we do the smoke test or the health check see whether it's actually responding on that port uh, with a status code that we expect we could even say it should um, uh, validate on some regular expression for example and then when that's all okay we add it to our load balancer HA proxy in this case when that's okay we remove one of the old containers and by old I mean of the previous build from the load balancer and we stop it and we repeat this process until the old containers the old build is replaced by the new build this results in a pipeline that has no downtime during deployment now the pipeline then looks some little something like this in Jenkins this is Jenkins 2 you see the stages clearly marked and you see the average times it takes and you also see any errors that would appear that would occur and then feedback if the build fails we had uh, what they call a siren of shame uh, which actually was a, uh, a an LED lamp and it had uh, some sort of uh, sound effect that if the build breaks you hear that and it's very important that people respect the build why would that be important because if you don't respect the build and the build fails the entire team is blocked right they cannot commit and if that takes long enough people will commit on their local machine and not push and then you have a branch again which we said we wouldn't do right so it's very important to to respect the build to work on that feedback the siren of shame now after uh, all this is implemented everything is done we uh, look at the results and the total build time per service is less than 10 minutes in this case and that's from the very start of the build after commit to the last deploy on production under 10 minutes that cycle I mentioned that the site was slow well the page load times were significantly improved from four to five seconds to half a second audience statistics were improved all across the board um, the number of people on the site how long they would be on the site uh, conversion rates button clicks all those metrics were very much improved very important the confidence and the velocity of the team jumped significantly they had fun working on the code again because it was not some legacy huge thing dragging dragging them down it was something that actually allowed them to work on features and deliver stuff to the business they also got to experiment with a lot of new technology 
uh, Angular, uh, Java stuff, event sourcing, very important. And they had a lot of fun generally. Now, of course, it wasn't all roses. Um, initially, team acceptance was pretty difficult. I saw a few skeptical looking faces here in the audience, and those faces are pretty much what we saw then. So, because that team was so used in to work a certain way, uh, it took some convincing to get them to work this way, right? Took a few weeks, but they were all very much convinced after that. Change in general is hard, and humans in general are afraid of change, and that's why they pushed back a little bit. Um, I mentioned the sprint of one week. It requires discipline to keep the meeting short. Um, don't spend half a day on refinement because that's half a day you're never going to get back and you're never going to get back. Um, so it requires discipline to keep those meetings short. When we did this project, Docker wasn't as mature as it is now. So we had some issues with that. Um, but in general, we were sort of betting on Docker moving fast enough so that the, the bugs that we did find that they would be fixed soonish and that generally happened. We also had some issues with uh, Amazon and the link, the network links to the on-premise data site or data center. And finally, JavaScript testing is something that bit us a few times. Um, uh, for people that do JavaScript regularly, NPM fails randomly, uh, packages get lost, um, testing breaks, so all those things we had issues with as well. Um, and when that happens, it broke the pipeline and we had to work on that. Not everybody that was on the team was as experienced with new technology as they would have liked. Um, and it scared them a few times. That's something that we learned that we need to spend more time on that to get people involved there. Uh, stability of the build pipelines, I mentioned that mostly. Um, but m very importantly, that the management and the leadership buy into this idea, and they bought into it at first, but you saw them slowly drifting away. And that happened with the business alignment as well. If you have successfully implemented continuous deployment, your development team has a serious risk or serious danger of outpacing the company. So you are moving far faster than the company can. Um, little anecdote when we did this, uh, before this was all implemented, this company um, relied on features being delivered in months or two months. So they could get all the marketing and all the, the posters and ad buys and everything ready to go. Because, you know, when we order a feature now, it will be delivered in two or three months. So we have plenty of time. When we got all this done, a story was entered into the backlog. We picked it up in a sprint. Two days later, it was in production. And that scared the bejeebas out of them because they weren't ready with the marketing yet. And they were like, can, can you pull that back? Can you take it out of production? So it requires your company to move faster as well. And that's a danger. So that's something you need to be aware of if you intend to do this. And last one, not enough focus on replacing the legacy application. Unfortunately, right now, this very moment, the legacy application is still up. Uh, I think 20% of s or something like that is still in use, but it's still 20%. So there needs to be enough focus on getting rid of that legacy application so that you can turn it off and delete it at the end. Questions? I'm sure there are a few. Sixteen. Sixteen people. Developers and testers. Um, we didn't use any st anything specific. There are now a few nice libraries out there, uh, but we mostly use a simple cookie-based mechanism, which we implemented ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Good question. Yeah. Okay, let me get to your first question. Um, rollbacks, I'm not sure if everybody understood or heard the question, but the question was, how do you do rollbacks in this scenario? Well, rollbacks in general are dangerous, um, and what would you roll back to? Um, in this particular case, let's, uh, let's go back to the uh, deployment pipeline uh, slides. I if something were to happen, for example here, your smoke test fails, then you stop the pipeline at that point. And the previous, well, the previous build is still uh, in production, right? And this new uh, service or this new version is not in the load balancers yet, so it's not receiving traffic. No problem. Wait a second. Database is, is a good one, but we'll come to that. So. In this case, the rollback, there is no rollback, but the rollback is simply fix whatever went wrong during deployment and run the deployment again. And then the cycle starts all, new, all over again and you start replacing those containers. So in all reality, there is no rollback, right? Uh, there's a roll forward. And because the amount of things that can go wrong with small steps, the amount of work that you need to do is small as well and rollbacks are always dangerous. So what happens if mid-deployment, mid so you have replaced two containers and the third one fails? Yeah, that's a problem that we didn't get to solve in time. I hope that it, that, that team is actually now fixing that. I'm not part of that team anymore. Um, but that's something that happens so rarely uh, that it's almost not useful to fix that in an automated way. Okay, the second question is, and I'll come to the databases after that one. The second question is, how do you do um, features that take a long time to, to, uh, to uh, implement, right? That was, okay. Well, y you do pairing. That's what I stipulated, pair programming. And you do the feature in small steps. And you do the feature behind the feature toggle. So you deploy every single step. And for example, you would deploy or you would write a login screen, but it's behind a feature toggle, so people don't see it yet. But it is there. And if you do feature branches, and you work on that feature for a week, and there's 15 commits, the problem is the entire team has done a lot of work in that week. You merge it, you get merge conflicts. Most likely, right? Then you start working with the entire team. Okay, what, what did you do? What did you do to fix the merge conflicts? By the time you fix the merge conflicts, half the team has already implemented other stuff, leading to mer new merge conflicts. So the reality is that feature branches never really work in this context because they bunch up the work and it's, it becomes increasingly difficult to merge. And if you get it merged, the chances of it failing are a lot higher, right? So I would very much recommend against it. Um, and in general, you see the usefulness of it yourself in a few weeks if you do this. Not always, but in for some features, yes. And it wouldn't be an if statement, but a little bit more elegant. But yeah, th in general, that it would be a switch. And well, that's something you would see f when you uh, get a story and you start refining it with the team, right? This is a feature that we don't want to let the public see yet. This is something that we want to test as a company first, for example. Um, this, it requires a disciplined and relatively experienced team, 
but in general you don't just start working on stuff and then finding out halfway that you ought to put in a feature toggle uh, during refinement and during planning you would hopefully see this coming right <laughs> How do you get a team to be experienced enough to do this? Well, the answer is you get enough experienced people on the team and then like oil, you spread it out. And how you spread it is pair programming. And that's pair programming is my default answer for almost every problem when it comes to development. Because I have a lot, of ex a lot of experience with testing, but the person I'm pairing with doesn't have. But we're working together, so by working with me, he or she learns how to do that, right? And that's how we did that. Okay, uh, 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 we'll, we'll, we can continue this after the talk. Uh, yeah, okay. The other question was, uh, I'll, I'll come to you uh, in a little bit, was databases. Um, how do you do database migrations in a continuous deployment context? Well, split them up. So if you have a database migration, for example, that renames a field, uh, renaming field can be very expensive when you don't do continuous deployment because if you have a, a terabyte of data uh, that single statement could take ages um, but instead add a second field with the new name deploy that migration make sure it runs then when that's all done when the new field is there and that should be very short to get there start deploying code that actually starts filling that new field third step make some code that fills the remaining of the records that you don't haven't touched yet. Fourth step, use the new field. Fifth step, get rid of the old field. So it requires a little bit more co coordination, but in general, when you do any sort of scaling, this applies as well, not only in continuous deployment. Hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. Uh, another question is about complexity because uh, feature toggles uh, decrease the complexity in branches but Im increase the complexity, as I understand it, increase the complexity in testing. Uh, how did you manage it, uh, the complexity? Because if two features can uh, interfere with each another depending on the toggle state. Yeah, that's a good question and um, I mentioned business alignment. Uh, this. Uh, funnily enough, they, they work together very well. Um, if you don't have business alignment that says that you can put stuff live, then you don't have control over the number of feature toggles or not enough control. You want to have as the least amount of feature toggles that's possible. So when a feature is done, it needs to be approved by the product owner or whatever business and then put live so that you can get rid of the feature toggle, right? and then you can add a new one because if you add four feature toggles the number of combinations starts going up a lot so the, the, the rule is to keep the number of feature toggles very limited and then in testing it becomes easier as well uh, one in the back I think there the guy in the red shirt yeah uh, it's, uh, you have complex structure of your team and uh, do you have uh, owner of uh, programming or who make review of the code, new code. I know uh, and I assume that uh, every code who should be tested in 100% but uh, in the general you have to, who uh, do you have a technical lead uh, who for create the whole system and the programmer will create it after uh, he mm, decides to goes into this direction or the programming invent a solution for everything what they uh, think is uh, great and uh, 
and every commit is uh, mm, not reviewed. Uh, I, I don't know. It's uh, it's clear uh, what I am asking. Maybe I will uh, give this ask. Uh, is uh, every commit is uh, passed uh, into master all the time, and uh, no one could uh, refuse it because uh, some uh, other programmer uh, decide that mm, this this not a good uh, code, even if one hundred percent is completely wrong. Yeah. Well. Um if you do code reviews, uh, if, if I understand your question correctly, it's do you go to master all the time? And if somebody puts in code that uh, does test but looks wrong, right? That's yeah, yeah. 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 I'm, uh, well, yeah, sure. Uh, but th that's something that uh, speaks to us as developers, as disciplined, and um, that we know the tools of our trade, right? So if I see, if I would see a commit from you. And that means that your pair partner has also signed off on what you committed, right? Because you were two, not one. Yeah, I understand. So that means that two people screwed up. And then we just talk with two people. So that would be a code review after the fact. And that's fine. That's, that's the same for uh, normal code or normal code, stuff that you don't continuous deploy, right? So there, there's no real difference. People can still... Um, check in code that doesn't satisfy the quality principles like syntax or stuff like that and if it passes the build pipeline so that it just means we need to talk to each other and make sure that we're on the same page and that we have the same ideas about quality okay one last question and then we need to wrap it up unfortunately white shirt here in the front this in particular you can have the process running quickly uh, but UI tests tend to be long-lasting mm -hmm. and you have to parallelize the question is how quickly do you have to parallelize in your experience um, well there's some some speed to be had yeah when parallelizing the question was do you get any benefit from making your tests run in parallel right yeah Sorry, can I, uh, for a moment, yeah? I'd like to ask to the people who are walking, please sit down and don't walk to the end of the speech, okay? Thank you very much. It's, it's just a, a bit cultural. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so the question is, if the UI tests run for an hour, would it make sense to either let them run for an hour or paralyze? Well, um, if the build pipeline takes too long, it's like a fire alarm in your house that goes off every day. After five days, you start ignoring the fire alarm. And then when on the sixth day, your house is actually on fire, you're like, nah, 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 nah. it's a false alarm again. So if the build pipeline takes too long and it fails, people will just commit randomly or, or stuff because the pipeline takes so long. So uh, the pipeline should be done in 10 to 15 minutes. That places a cap, a limit on the number of tests you can do. And you could, for example, do very expensive UI tests uh, at night, right? Just to make sure that that's still working. And then you, so you didn't split off, you do sort of a parallel run, a little bit different. Okay, um, that's all we have uh, today, folks. Sorry about that. Um, if you want to reach me, um, I'm on Twitter and through email. Thank you so much, Poland. <laughs>